he, he did break down about five miles from here, but in the goodness of the GTOAA folks that are in this room, uh, several of us went down there and helped him and got his, uh, got his Duramax fired up. Even though the guy was a, uh, he was a Cummins guy, he still figured out how to get that Duramax <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, Artie Bestwick. Thank you, uh, people, for making this, uh, I think it's the 43rd uh, GTO convention. Uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, I've been to a lot of these conventions. I didn't make them all because back in the real full-time race days, I would make commitments to different racetracks to be there, and they didn't like it when I tried to cancel out, so... Most of the time I made the race events and had to take a pass at the uh, convention date. Uh, there was a year that uh, I raced the Super Chevy event, which went on for many, many years. And uh, the event coordinator put me and Dino Don, you probably have heard of that name, together as a, one of the feature races at the Super Chevy events. And after doing it for two or three years and finding out that uh, we was one of the biggest draws uh, from the people that called in wanting to know if Dino Don and Arnie Beswick would be at the event, he decided that he better keep this event going for a few years. So we probably raced the Super Chevy event and they, you know, had 15, 20 events per year. So it was a pretty hectic schedule. And, uh, uh, the only time I ever refused to go was if uh, somebody else was offering me more money that was a lot closer to my home. So most of the time I was at the Super Chevy events there for several years. Anyway, uh, as you probably all know, I started racing in the 1950s, the early 1950s, 51, was basically the first event I went to before I was inducted into the uh, Army as a forward observer and ended up in Korea between North Korea and South Korea on a mountaintop called Papasan in a foxhole uh, as a forward observer with three other guys and we usually lived in the same foxhole till the enemy uh, found out where we was at and then started blowing us away with their artillery so then we'd have to dig another foxhole down this mountain a ways. A little bit too loud. Sorry, sorry everybody. But anyway, uh, so I was at, as a forward observer in Korea for uh, 1953, end of 1953, and then uh, in, uh, later that year, uh, I was able to buy a 62 Catalina. Uh, it wasn't brand new. It, it was a demonstrator. I guess you could say it was new. But uh, I kept that and I raced that in 1960, uh, uh, excuse me, 54 and 1955. And, and as you probably know, in 1956, and maybe you don't know, a local Dodge dealer talked me into driving a Dodge D500-1, which was a pretty good kick-butt car because it had a little 318 cubic inch Hemi motor. For power-wise, it was far ahead of any Chevrolet or Ford or anything else that was out there. There was a Pontiac, very, very, very few of the two four-barrel, I think it was a 317 cubic inch Pontiac, I don't remember the exact cubic inches, but it was somewhere about the same size as my Dodge. And I did race this gentleman a, a few times, and he was the only car that even come close to that Dodge. The Dodge was far ahead of anything else on the track. Our biggest problem was it was a three-speed transmission column shift, and 
to this day, I could probably put a shift column in that car blindfolded because it broke so many times. <laughs> and in uh, 57, the same Dodge dealer talked me into a 57 Dodge. The first one, he kind of financed himself and gave me the option to buy it after I had raced it a year, which I did. Uh, because I had it sold, basically, after uh, I bought it. I sold it to a, a friend that lived close by. And then I got the 57. The 57 Dodge come with a, it was called a D501. It was, uh, had a 354 cubic inch Hemi, Chrysler Hemi motor in that car. Uh, that car was not even close to being competitive with what the 56 was because the, that, that heavy motor was way too heavy and it was sticking out front quite a bit further in the chassis than what the Dodge uh, 56 did. So I did win some races once they allowed the slicks, but boy was a street tire when they were still going with street tires like we had to run in 56. The sh fuel injection Chevys and the there was a few bad ports back in those days, too. They could eat me off the line, and I couldn't catch them. 57, why, uh, as you might know, uh, I started feeling uh, what the Pontiacs were all about. I had a couple different guys that had 57 Pontiacs that I played around with quite a bit. One guy was a handicapped guy, so uh, he ripped relied on me a lot to work on the car and drive it some for him. And I could tell you right then that uh, the handwriting was on the wall with these Pontiacs. So in early 1958, I made sure I got my name in on a 58 Pontiac and the rest is pretty much history from that time on because that 58 Pontiac was so dominant uh, even though it had a column shift, and I did break my share of shift columns in that car, finally, uh, when the, I was able to get my hands on a four-speed, I uh, put a, we have to call it a Corvette four-speed, because that would have come out of, anyway, I drove it with a four-speed in it. It's a time or two I tried to drive it in the stock class, with the four speed, but uh, it wasn't too long before my competition realized I was making an extra shift uh, before I got to the end of the quarter mile than it did with the three speed. So they pretty much outlawed me in the stock class and then they put me in a, we, a gas class was very, very popular back then from A gas, B gas, D gas, C gas, all the way down the line to E gas, depending on how big the motor was, it went by cubic inch to the weight of the car. So the bigger the motor and the lighter the car, the higher the gas class you ran in. Well, this car of mine, my 58, was just about heavy enough to get into D gas, but it, I had to add a few pounds. I had to add about 200 pounds, 150 some pounds to get, to get in D gas. So quite often, if the competition wasn't real crazy, I run in C gas. Well, I was quite a bit heavier than what I needed to be in C gas. So the only time I actually run in the D gas class uh, was in uh, big events where they was paying pretty good money for the class winners of the game. Gas class were very, very popular in those days, far more than the stock classes. So I run uh, this 58 Pontiac in uh, C gas when the competition wasn't real big and heavy and dominant that I thought I had a chance of with, at least holding my own. And then in a, the big, big national event, events that I run the gas class in, I'd always run it in D-gas. And most of the time I was pretty capable of winning in D-gas even though I had to put 200 more pounds in it. So That was my uh, race car in 1958 and pretty much 1959, even though my wife decided she had to have a 59 Pontiac. And uh, 
Well, we did. It was mostly a streetcar for her. She worked at a General Electric plant for 35 years, and that's what she drove to work uh, for many years. And uh, I, she ran it a few times in what we call the powder puff shootout uh, that they had at several of the tracks in our area, anywhere from Wisconsin, the Illinois tracks, and a couple of the Iowa tracks. They run this powder puff. It had to be a street-driven car for the women, and uh, she did pretty well with that, even though it was a three-speed stick car also. Uh, in 1960, I'm sure you all know what I managed to get my hands on. The first, as far as I know, it was the first, and I was always told it was the first, 60 Pontiac with a four-speed transmission. And uh, you talk about a factory-built kick-butt car. That car was so far ahead of its time compared to the competition of Chevrolet, Ford, Dodge, or any of them. That uh, I don't know I, if that car got ever beat. It was because of the driver's screw-up. Uh, spinning too much on the starting line and not cleaning his tires off and things like that. I don't remember for sure if I ever did get beat, but I don't want to say I won everything because I maybe didn't. Uh, and so I kept that car until the 61s come out. And uh, of course the 61s was the first car that I had that had any aluminum on it. It did not have a complete aluminum front end. It only had the aluminum front bumper and rear bumper. It did come with a, again, a 389 engine, but they did have some optional parts for the 389. They had a different camshaft, uh, McKellar 7, McKellar 8. I don't remember if they had the 9 or 11 at that point in time or not. They, I know they did in 62, but 61, I, Again, that 61 Pontiac was so far ahead of its competition. A lot of people give me credit for doing a lot of winning. Don't give me the credit. <laughs> that was a, just a kick-butt car that Pontiac put together thanks to people like John DeLorean and Bucky Knudsen, who was, if they would was a GM company today. GM wouldn't be owned by China like it is now. It would be owned by American people. So John DeLorean and Bucky Newson was just two of the greatest men that Pontiac ever had under their roof. So that in '62, uh, uh, I went to the naturally the the '62 when I ordered it. It was available with the aluminum front end bumpers and all. It was a, it also had the 421 Super Duty, uh, which you're all well aware of. And again, that 62 was just so dominant in competition events that I went to, and I traveled some pretty good miles with that 62, far more than I did any of the other cars, because the southern tracks start getting a hold of the idea of having these big super stock races. The, super, the management at some of your southern tracks was so far ahead of some of the northern tracks it was pathetic when it come time to putting these super stock races together. It was nothing for them to have 30 to 40 and many times 50 cars in super stock. And they would run to the first winner was determined he would have to set out. Now, there was no such thing as bracket racing and that kind of crap in those days. They, excuse me, the bracket racers out here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we, uh, we determined the first round winner. Then they'd run the whole class again with him setting out the first, the first place winner, the first round, go around of wins. He set out until they determine a second place winner. They did it pretty much all the way down to four places. At that point, they would run those four winners against each other. 
and each time uh, the winner was determined, he would get a pretty good payout for his first, second, and third, and fourth place win. Well, when the run the four winners together, there was another, usually a $500 payout for the overall winner of the four winners. So the type of crowds that those tracks had that did those type of races was phenomenal. I mean, they never had enough bleachers. A lot of the tracks that had trees anywhere close to the starting line, there would be some of the young bucks that could climb those damn trees and sit in the limbs of the trees. So uh, it was pretty colorful, to say the least. And uh, like I said, the crowd they had and the money they paid out and the advert, and of course, practically all of them just had very, very colorful announcers. And that helped a lot as well. The announcers that uh, pretty much knew the drivers, knew what they was driving, and uh, knew their background. And it just made for super, super uh, colorful type of racing. Far more than what you see today was your brackets, dra dragsters and all that handicapped crap. Unfortunately, uh, that's kind of what it's developed into today. Well then in uh, 63, as you might know, what I got in 63, Pontiac made available until GM, uh, the government made GM, uh, told them that because at that particular time in 1963, GM had 57% of the automotive market, what they wouldn't give to have that today. But anyway, uh, GM said, you have a monopoly on the automotive market. You either have to split your company up and send one of your divisions another direction and it cannot be affiliated with GM no more. It can't be owned by GM. So GM had no choice but to either break up their company or not promote their car sales. Well, the only way to figure the cheapest way to quit promoting their car sales was to get out of racing. So sometime in early 63, GM made the announcement that there will be no more racing cars from any of the divisions in, in GM. Well, that kind of broke the hearts of many, many, many people, me included. And, uh, but I did, at that point in time, manage to get my hands on a 63 wagon and a 63 Catalina Swiss cheese car. Later on in the year, I wasn't eligible to get the coupe because they only made five or six of them. And they went to people that was more uh, kiss butt than what I was. <laughs> and Mick, Mickey Thompson after the, as you probably know, after GM got out of racing, well, he didn't want nothing to do with GM anymore, so he went to Ford, and uh, I managed to talk him into selling me his 63 Le Mans Coupe. So I actually had my share of Pontiac race cars in 1963 and did my fair share of racing with those cars. Uh, yes, I did let some of my true people drive some of them. The one big event that uh, I had all three cars at, and I wasn't able to drive all three naturally. I had the wagon, I had the coupe, and I had the Catalina. And I'll never forget, uh, both, all three cars had, were in different classes, luckily. The coupe was in the top super stock class. They went to something like cubic inch to weight or something. I don't remember how they actually broke the classes down. But the, the 63 coupe fell in a class with all Thunderbolts were very, very big that year in 1964. Very big, very kick-ass good running cars. So the, and because Ford was very certain their Thunderbolt was going to win that event. They pretty much sponsored that Daytona race event. Now that wasn't just a one-night deal. 
The Daytona Speed Week event lasted from on a Saturday night and the start of Speed Weeks to the following Saturday night before the Daytona 500. It was a whole week of racing. And uh, so my coop and wagon and Catalina did their pair of share of women and the final runoff in uh, the, for the final big money. In fact, uh, not only was there a $2,500 purse to win the overall shootout, there was also, Ford was so sure that their Thunderbolts would be the overall winner, that they gave a Ford convertible away for first place winner of the uh, soup that Daytona shootout. So I ended up winning what's the coop in the final runoff. What's uh, and it, uh, naturally it was against another Thunderbolt. There was probably forty some Thunderbolts there. Chevrolet really didn't have a real you know competitive car. Then Mopar had nothing in that year for a competitive car. So it was my car is against a lot of a lot of a lot of Thunderbolts. Thunderbolts. So uh, it, it, Ford was so positive, Ford management people that was there at the race events tore me down four different times during that week's event to prove <laughs> that the thing was stock. And luckily it was NASCAR officials that governed the NASCAR races and make sure everything is up to the standards of uh, what the rules say they have to be. And they was always there to mic it for the cylinder bore size, the valve size, the compression set, amount, and uh, the manifold design, the carburetor size. They was there and they knew what the hell they was looking for. And if it was out of line, I would have been out. But I wasn't, luckily. And, uh, so I ended up winning that convertible. And uh, that was, again, because I was going from dollar to dollar to dollar and bought more stuff than I could really afford. So I had no more and got home with it and I had people offer me some decent money for it. Decent money when I was in that day anyway. And I ended up selling the convertible, which I regretted many times afterwards. So uh, that was the story in 1963. Uh, I, I kind of made headlines down there at Daytona that year. And later, the following year, in 1960, this was 63 down there at Daytona, in 64, some of you people that's been around a day or two probably remember a paper that was printed in California. It was printed it was called Drag News. And the lady that printed it, her uh, family, Chet Herbert, was her brother, who I think might still be living in a, today. He had a huge, huge engine shop as well as a camshaft company. So this woman, Doris Herbert, really knew how to put a newspaper together. It was all about drag racing. And she had lots and lots of uh, uh, people that helped her write these columns about the different areas of race events around the country of uh, USA. Well, this particular year, because she had so much pressure to do this event, she decided to put together a drag news super stock invitational. She did that at a track in Ohio, and anybody that won any amount of Superstock races that year or the previous years and had any kind of name in Superstock was invited to that event to run in the Superstock Invitational. Well, yes, my name got drawn out of the hat too, and uh, anybody you could name that had raised the Superstock car and did any kind of winning whatsoever was there. 
from the Don Nicholsons to the Net Ram Chargers to the to Bowen Commandos to the Granny Sox, uh, uh, Dick Brand, you name anybody that was had raced in that t time period previous to that event was all there because of the, this magazine, I don't want to call it a magazine, <laughs> a paper, newspaper that just Doris Herbert put together. It was so popular that everybody just bent over backwards to make sure they got a little bit of print in her uh, drag racing magazine. So uh, it was a huge event and uh, luckily again uh, my, I did have both cars. Uh, I, my, uh, I didn't have the coupe at that time. I had it, but it, I had gotten it from Mickey Thompson and it was pretty well beat up when I got it engine-wise. It smoked terrible and it didn't have the potential it needed to be competitive out there, so I never took it there. I just had the coupe, or excuse me, the wagon and the 63 Catalina. Well, the final run for the big money at this event ended up between me and Dino Don Nicholson. Well, it was pretty close, half track, and uh, I think I was a little bit ahead of him. But uh, all of a sudden he dropped back, and just to be a smart ass myself, which I can be now and then, <laughs> I stuck my hand out the window and kind of waved. I was ahead of him enough that I knew I'd probably stay ahead of him. And I'll never forget what he did in return. He was so, can I use the word pissed? Anyway, he, he was so upset, let's use that word. Uh, he actually kind of halfway opened the door and stuck his hand out and made sure I seen his finger. So that was the talk of that particular event after that particular run, actually. So, uh, I won with that car, and I did win with a 63 Catalina, and I think my final run with that car was against uh, one of the Ram Chargers Dodges. Uh, they also had a car in the top class, but some of those Ram Chargers and Golden Commandos, and uh, they were starting to come into the picture in the 64. And naturally, you all know what they did in 65. They wanted to make damn sure they was going to be king of the road, or king of the drag strip, with their so-called funny car, all their wheelbase pieces of stuff. You know, and today, I, I'll never forget being in, in uh, Arizona for that IHRA Nationals in early 1965. And they was calling these cars up to the tr track for their particular run up or time trials or whatever it might have been, and uh, we had kind of, they had quite a colorful announcer at this track, and uh, after a few rounds of competition, he got this he got this idea those cars are so odd looking. I should call them funny. And that's where the word funny car hit the newspapers, the drag newspapers, including drag news. He, him using the word funny on those 65 altered wheelbase, you know, Dodges and Plymouths. And uh, to this day, I thought that was an insult to the drag racing world when they used funny on those cars, even though they were funny. Uh, but I just thought, Gen HRA will never buy that word funny. But sure enough, before the year's over, they did call them, if you probably know, Super Factory Experimental. That was what the first terminology was for those cars. And they, <coughs> in, when they started getting some ink written about them. They was called Super Factor Experimental. Now my car, which I was driving at that particular time in 65, was my 64 GTO. Well, 
the 64 GTO, even though it had a 421 and all the bells and whistles that you could put on a stock motor, it was not competitive with those 65 Mopars. They just had way, way too much traction. It was the competitive, if I could have got off the line with them, but those cars could really, really uh, be on a slippery track and get off the starting line because of their weight distribution. So anyway, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to be competitive with them. And then as time went on, they didn't call they, was, they dropped this super factory experimental class and put everybody of that car, of that run in the super factory experimental, we all got thrown in to the funny car class. And I said, my car is not funny. I, yeah, I got a supercharger on my engine. Well, that puts it into the funny car class, sorry. So as much uh, arguing as I did about that, as well as some other drivers that also got thrown into the funny car class, next thing you know, everybody was pretty much forced into be, uh, building an altered wheelbase car to be competitive because they were so good off of the starting line and we didn't have such things as rosin and those things that was accepted anyway. We had it done in the southern tracks, they was way ahead of, again, they was ahead of us, big time, of, uh, ahead of the northern tracks anyway, and they did have, I remember when Ronnie Sox first used that damn rosin against me, and uh, what's he putting on the track? You know, they sprinkle it uh, out of their bag, and then they'd sweep it in, and the, the damn track management tr owners and whoever was running the race, let them get by with it. And it took them quite a bit of while, you know, time to do that. And some of us guys that didn't know what rosin was all about, we was raising cane, but because we was down south, they was going to do it anyway, and they did it. So we was pretty much forced to know, learn how to run our cars in the rosin uh, category. Now, they didn't make a special class for you or anything. You just had, if, if you're going to be competitive, you either better get in the track that, of the car that just run ahead of you and hope that he put enough rosin down because we didn't have the asphalt condition that we have for tracks today where you really, and we didn't have wide tires in those days neither. I think the limit of the tire width probably was a 10 inch wide was all that was allowed. That there was nothing available that was any bigger. So uh, we had a time there when, if we didn't have the rosin ability and with us, I, believe it or not, I bought my first rosin from Ronnie Sox because they seemed to know where they could get their hands on it. And, and because he had already got beat down, I broke something, I'm sorry, he broke something in the motor. And I said, you go to sell me some of that rosin uh, uh, stuff you got there? Well, I'm not running here, yeah, I'll go. So he put a price on it. I had the money, it wasn't that crazy. You know, I think he'd say 10, 15 bucks, if I remember right, for a little bag of it. And uh, it really, really, really helped. And that was the first I had had any experience on it. And I think at the time, I was at a track in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, that uh, was kind of a, the track owner advertised the track as cow pasture racing at its best. And believe me, uh, it was kind of a cow pasture. There was, uh, there was a, quite a divide between the two lanes of traffic, of uh, grass, so it was just, it was two lanes of blacktop. Not the great blacktop by any means, but uh, again, he knew how to promote the races, and he did do a hell of a job, a hell of a crowd. And uh, as you know, from the 64 area, I run the, uh, my Super Factor Experimental, which I got thrown into the funny car. I did quite a bit of racing with that in 1964 and 5, and then as the funny cars become so popular, I knew if I was going to continue to be competitive, I had to have something similar with either an altered wheelbase 
or something that I could get more weight on the rear wheels. So in 1966, you, as you might know, I built a two-frame car. Uh, it was two-frame front end. It still had, to this day, it still got the original frame and the back part of the car. It didn't have a tube frame all the way back, but I put the motor back a ways, so it, it did end up with more weight on the rear wheels, and it was quite competitive with the cars I run against that were older wheelbase. Mine was not older. It was just because I had the engine set back made it a lot more user-friendly on the starting line and competitive. So that was the car I run in 1956, excuse me, 66 and 67 that probably a lot of you might have seen over the years. It still is running yet today. The guy I sold it to uh, was my traveling mechanic, you might say, and eventually he decided that he wanted that 66 car. Well, he didn't own it for many months before his mother had passed away and he inherited a ton of money and ended up moving to Tennessee. So that's where the car is today at his new residence and shop in Tennessee. And uh, so he, I'm sure some of you have seen him around to some degree. He don't get out to travel a lot because he had a terrible, terrible, uh, I guess you would call it, uh, what do they call it, a hurricane kind of a thing goes through there and in his area, not too far from Nashville. And it, it blew his complete shop and damaged the house very bad when that hurricane. So he's been pretty much uh, trying to rebuild his shop and a house to live in. And uh, so he hasn't done a lot of racing since then. And uh, his uh, big hauler got damaged pretty good as well. But uh, he'll be back out with it. Nationally in 58, excuse me, 68, I come